The bell. An unusual sense of excitement pervaded her visit to temple this evening. There had been an argument over lunch between her and the grown-ups when she had announced her decision to ring the bell in front of the sanctuary at the hour of lamp lighting. If Thangam can ring it, so can I. She debated hotly. They protested in shocked voices. Thangam is the daughter of the temple priest. She is permitted to touch the bell. She responded angrily that Thangam came over to play hide and seek every afternoon and behaved no differently from any of them. Besides, she added, goading them deliberately. We are all equal in the eyes of God. She was not quite sure whether they had heard this bit, for they had already turned away in disgust. But after lunch, she caught them whispering about that horrid English school she goes to, which meant that they had heard. But she was sure that they had not taken her very seriously. That was the trouble with grown-ups. They always presumed that if they told her that she would understand everything when she was older, she would accept their wisdom and authority unquestioningly and not dream of going against them. Oh well. She would show them this time. She therefore submitted with good grace to the suggestion that she accompany her grandmother to the tank for her evening bath, though she really preferred the makeshift bathroom at the back of the house. She hated the slippery stone steps of the tank. The dark green slime at their edges menaced her foothold. The water had a sullen, dangerous look and always felt bitterly cold. But she endured it all today with no complaint, chattering brightly. She did not fuss even when the tiny fishes swarmed around her ankles, pecking at them viciously, threatening her precarious balance. Back again at the house, she had to undergo the intensely uncomfortable ritual of hair dressing. They smoothed her hair with what felt like a whole jar of oil, separated each shining strand till it hung limp and straight and lifeless down her back, then tied it up in a tight, skin-stretching knot on the top of her head, securing it with a fiber of banana stem. She was thankful none of her school friends could see her like this. Droplets of oil oozing down her temples gave her tiny shivers of disgust. The back of her neck felt slimy, made her long to wriggle out of her skin. She bit back her annoyance, contenting herself with a savage swipe at her oily forehead with the edge of her skirt when they were not watching. She was ready before the evening flurry of lamp lighting had started. The old toothless major domo of the household, Kelu Nair, was instructed to accompany her today. Why could they never understand how ridiculous she felt being escorted by him? She had reminded her mother many times that she walked alone to school every day when they were back in the town, that she even went by herself to the bakery at the end of the road to buy sweets and cakes. Her mother simply pretended not to hear. She alternately envied and detested the grown-ups for their loathsome habit of not hearing whatever they found inconvenient to answer. Sometimes, if she arrived at the strategic blend of authority and appeal, she could force Kelunaya to walk a few steps behind her and pretend that he did not belong to her at all. But this was something she rarely achieved. Today he stuck obstinately to her side, imparting bits and pieces of information and advice that she tried to ignore. She quickened her steps as they reached the road, almost breaking into a run. Kelunaya shouted at her to stop and wait for him. She did not care to explain to any of them that she tried to cover this stretch of road as quickly as possible because the gravel hurt her bare feet. At the temple entrance, she slowed down, grateful for the feel of the sun-warmed stone. The usual knot of women was gathered around the three-tired stone lamp at the outer door, talking earnestly in hushed voices, their faces grave and sad. Kelunaya edged as close to them as he dared. She knew he drank in every whisper that he could distinguish that he would impart it all, embellished with many scandalous details of his own invention to her mother and great-grandmother over dinner tonight. And they started their ritual circling of the outer walls of the temple. She noticed that the football game had already begun in the courtyard beside the sanctuary of Krishna. She enjoyed watching the players, more so because of her obvious delight in the vigor of their game. Arriving at the sanctuary of Krishna, she saw the small door obstinately closed. Kelunaya had told her time and time again that the image inside was unimaginably beautiful. Today she circled it hurriedly, her mind full of her secret mission, and almost ran along provoking an incomprehensible torrent of protest from Kelunaya, who could not keep up with her. The eastern facade of the temple always enchanted her. When she recalled it afterwards, as she often did, her memories were full of sound and color. The 
river ran through here, the jade green of its water melting first into the rice fields beyond and then into the luminous evening sky. In the enclosed area where the women bathed, shrill voices rose above the wet slapping of cloth against stone. The rock beneath her feet was turning cool. She remembered that the hour of lamp lighting was near and hurried back through the shadow-filled hall. Beyond the tall golden flagpole, tiny pinpoints of light pierced the warm darkness of the inner sanctuary. Kelunaya, muttering angrily, was close upon her heels. Rounding the wall, she acknowledged with an involuntary intake of breath the sparkling rectangle of flame that outlined the door of the corner sanctuary of Ayapa. Inside the temple, her feet lovingly caressed the cool stone of the inner courtyard, reveling in its smooth, worn feel. She bowed a perfunctory greeting to the little doll-like Parvati, crossed her arms and touched her ears before the dark, almost invisible Ganesha and came hurriedly upon the crowded main sanctuary. A familiar scent of hot oil and flowers, of bibhuti and wet clothes welcomed her. The women of the Nambudri household stood in front in a tight invisible circle that no one else must touch, their eyes closed, clutching their thatch umbrellas that obscured everyone's vision, their lips moving in an ecstasy of prayer. She asked her way towards them, ignoring Kelunaya's shocked whispers of protest, almost bumping into one of the ridiculous umbrellas. She saw Thangam standing near the steps, looking remote and wrapped with devotion. The rhythm of the Edaka was mounting crazily as the door was flung open. She blinked at the sudden vision of gold. Before she could regret her decision or go back upon it, she elbowed herself quickly through the untouchable circle of Nambutri women, nearly floundering on the slippery steps. The sight of the big bell above her touched her with a heady excitement. She could distinguish Kelunai's frantically whispered threats, but she reached up, rang the bell with one resounding clang, and was down the steps before he realized what was happening. Dimly she was aware of dark looks and subdued murmurs pursuing her as she permitted Kelunaya to drag her away. Returning home in the gathering shadow, his imprecations grew louder and more vehement. Warnings of the great-grandmother's terrible wrath were becoming real. She paid no heed at all, for she felt wondrously light-hearted, excitingly happy. As she climbed over the stone stile to enter the house, she turned for a last look at the temple. It gleamed back at her conspiratorially, blessing her happiness. She was in dire disgrace. Their tight-lipped silence was more eloquent than speech, as was the conspicuous absence of her favorite tiny papadums at dinner. The papadums specially ordered for her every holiday and served regularly at every meal. She did not really care, for the silence seemed to be filled with a thousand voices singing within her, and she was quite, quite sure that the golden god within the temple, in whose eyes all are equal, had accepted her gesture 